Thank you. Okay, so the second presenter will be Yaxian Xiao. Uh, welcome to the meeting, Yaxian. She will be presenting on stories of transnationalism. And you saw in her um, flyer that we sent around that there is some other script there, which I will not endeavor to read. Um, maybe she'll be able to help us out there. Did you want to share in your screen at all, Yaxian? Uh, yes, I have a presentation actually, like a PowerPoint okay. thing. So am I just able to do it now? You should be able to, admin? yes. Okay, I'm quite sure I um, enabled that. All right, can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay, cool. Um, I might just it's jump lovely. straight into it. Yeah, go for it. Um, so I'm Yux. Uh, today I'll be presenting my recently published paper called Stories of Transnationalism. And the script is actually um, a quote from something my grandma said while we were on call. Um, and it means, I, you see me, um, I see you. Um, so, uh, just a little bit about me, because I'm not sure how many people know me. I see a lot of familiar faces, so that's been quite nice. Um, I'm currently an honours student at UWA, and my current thesis research is on Greta Thunberg. And in 2019, I was studying at the University of Hong Kong as part of my student exchange program with the New Colombo Plan. Um, and in this presentation, um, sorry. Um, I'm going to be focusing on three parts, but before I get into that, I'm just going to briefly describe my paper because I know we're all very busy people, so don't expect that any of you have read it yet. <laughs> um, so basically my paper is an autoethnographic account of my transnational relationship with my grandmother. And it's a everyday perspective into our transnational care and relationship. And my paper also prompts existing researchers to engage with and adapt our ways of researching transnationalism within the global context. So today my presentation is going to be firstly discussing very briefly the creative capacities of narratology as a method in my research and then I'm going to reflect on the publication process as an undergraduate student and then as um, my paper as I've started to think about it while writing this presentation within the COVID-19 era. Okay, so um, narratology um, is actually not a new concept in our field. Um, in an article that I had to read as part of my research process, um, there's this woman called McGranahan and she writes that anthropology as a discipline engages in explaining, understanding and interpreting cultural worlds. And so storytelling becomes this methodology that helps us make sense of cultural worlds. And if we think of like, you know, pioneers of people in our field, like Gertz, who uses thick description, we know that storytelling as a means to um, write about or flesh out ethnographic data is not something that's, you know, totally experimental for us. Um, and in so saying that, I wanted to talk about a quote that she had in her article, which is to begin with the story that can't be left out. And this was something that I found super inspiring and motivational when it came down to the nitty gritty of the creative writing process. Um, uh, I feel that the creative writing process is very difficult, <laughs> um, much more difficult than it is uh, to write academically because, well, I, also because I was writing about my own life, which is a little bit challenging. Um, and so, the four creative capacities of narratology, as I felt in my research, was that um, narratology was theoretical storytelling. And what that basically means is that it's a way of organizing writing and grounding theoretical approaches um, in ethnographic inquiry that can capture a more holistic element of subject and ethnographer that begins to constitute a greater understanding of anthropology. And this links with my second point on grounded ethnography. Um, and my third point is that um, uh, stories speak for themselves, which I think that stories are memorable and they prompt reflection in the reader. And so my short stories, there's six of them in my paper, I think they become more than just stories about, you know, my grandmother and I um, going home or my family or my childhood. Instead, they're kind of thick descriptors that grow to signify a greater transnational um, aspect of our lives and I think it 
prompts the reader to reflect on their own transnational relationships with other people. And actually last year, after this book, uh, after this article was published, I actually read a report about how to write an engaging report. And it said that writing should spark curiosity in the reader. And I think that's probably one of the foremost capacities of narratology in research is that it engages us and, you know, it draws us in and wants, it makes us want to keep reading. And it's, it's a nice, I guess, refreshing surprise from what can often be very dry <laughs> um, academic reading. So, and lastly, um, I think narratology is a really important way to organize writing. Um, writing about people through story is really confronting. It makes you really look at your data and you have to think about how you are representing um, your subjects or your objects that you're writing about and also how that in turn reflects you as, an, as a researcher. And in writing creatively, you have to articulate and in so you have to know your data really well and then tell someone, the reader, et cetera, um, and then after the writing process and even through the writing process, you're able to interpret and formulate um, your own interpretations of how this is reflected in theory or not and its wider implications. Um, yeah, I found the short excerpts in my paper the most challenging aspect of the writing process. It's very difficult to write about your own life. And so when McGranahan wrote that you should begin with a story that can't be left out, that's exactly what I did. And I think in the end, the stories speak for themselves. I think the personal aspect of my work makes it engaging and it does invite readers to reflect on their own transnational relationships. And I think that the creative writing process makes you tell what you know in a way that sometimes academic writing doesn't encourage or seldom encourages. And so there is, I guess, a little bit of that. There's quite a lot of value in that as well. Okay, so now I will reflect on the publication process. So I actually wrote this paper as part of a unit that I studied at UWA in my second year. Um, it's actually run by Martin here at UWA. And it took me over a year after I finished that unit to write to publication standard, mainly because of word count. Um, and then I sent it off to the editor at JUE and while I was doing that whole year of writing, I was in Perth and also in Hong Kong for student exchange. And it was really hard to find time to write. So I usually wrote on very long plane rides, which actually I think now looking back at it is kind of awesome because that kind of physical transnationality um, of my life made the writing process more motivating because I was normally flying either to see my grandparents or coming back from just seeing them or I had just been on holiday and had to say goodbye to family or friends. Um, and then after that was another year of back and forth emailing and it's um, the editor of the Journal of Undergraduate Ethnography is actually based in Canada. So that's in itself also a little bit of a transnational correspondence. Um, and then I went through two peer reviews and the copy editing process. And after the second peer review, everything happened quite fast. And my paper was published within a month. So overall, I found the publication process tough, but good. I think as an undergraduate student, having your feedback come from various sources outside of your home institution really establishes yourself and your own confidence in your work and capabilities as a young researcher who's trying to figure out what they want to do with their lives. Um, and Martin was a really great help and always keen to read drafts and provide me with guidance. And I am very, very grateful for the experience. I feel like it has set me up to write a solid honours thesis and for my plans to write a second piece for publication after honours as well. So I'd like to finish my presentation. I've tried to keep it very brief because I know that we all, um, it is a Friday, so. Um, and I was thinking about my paper to, uh, the last couple of weeks as preparing for this presentation about how COVID has changed my relationship with my grandparents. And if I'm honest, I think if anything, COVID has made transnational relationships and transnational care more relevant, um, especially uh, relationships that are intergenerational, like the one I share with my grandparents. I think in the literature, um, this would count as like crisis. And so 
ICT communications inevitably would have gained a lot of traction since early last year when COVID um, became a global pandemic. And maybe even more so now that there are different mutant strains. Um, I FaceTimed my grandparents a lot during COVID and when we were doing our brief lockdown last year and it was hard to not be able to visit but I think that because we already had like this familiarity with using WhatsApp and calling and texting regularly it meant that this the not being able to fly to visit was less jarring than it might have been for others who um, were less familiar with using technology to stay in touch and so I'm interested to see how COVID has impacted the use of ICTs in facilitating this kind of transnational care because everyone's had to rely on it in the last year or so because you know flying has been kind of moot um, and even if it's just not loved ones and family anymore because the use of more like more widely speaking zoom right now and you know microsoft teams and whatnot to communicate with our colleagues and um, work mates and friends and companies and within institutions as well and I'm wondering whether narratology is a viable way to ground this sort of ethnographic research. So um, yeah, that's it. And thank you for listening to my presentation. I am happy to take a few questions now. I know it's very brief, but I wanted to keep it short, so. Nearly forgot to unmute myself. Thank you, Yax. Um, maybe if you stop sharing your screen now, we can see everyone. Here we go, thank you. Um, so yeah, same thing, if you um, have a question, please raise your hand. Greg, thank you. Thanks for that uh, presentation. Um, I, I'm wondering about these um, creative capacities, the four that you listed there. To what degree do those hold when the storytelling is only a matter of autoethnography, or to what degree when you are recounting the stories of others uh, that, that you're conducting research with that have, that have not been part of your life. Uh, particularly the, the, the one that says stories speak for themselves. M my experience in the field uh, with boogies was I, I couldn't understand when they were telling me a story, how one thing followed from another, why all of a sudden the genealogy got inserted at a particular point and, and why the temporality was moving around in a nonlinear fashion. And it, you know, it, it, to me, the stories never spoke for themselves. It required a, you know, a lot of analysis of, of kind of boogies conceptions of time and how individuality is is something that's embedded in ge in genealogies rather than our sense of an autonomous individuality so I, I'm wondering how um, how how much those those four dimensions um, hold when it's uh, a matter of recounting stories that are not part of autoethnography thanks um, very interesting question. I think when I was making this presentation, I was really only thinking about autoethnography. So, and I don't have experience about um, with narratology that's not related to autoethnography. So, I think that whatever I have to say is not going to be very um, based on a very strong foundation. But I do think that um, once that kind of analysis is done and that you are able to situate the stories within the cultural cultural and social context of, for your example, the Bugis people, that when you come to write the process and write the story, that that kind of prompts you to think about um, and reflect on the experience itself and for them. And so I think that's what I mean by how they speak for themselves is after you've done the analysis and even through the writing process, they kind of tell you things. And then when you read back at them, they also tell you new things. Thank you. And Farida. Thanks. Um, thanks, Yax. That was, um, yeah, really, really interesting. Um, all of my colleagues will know what my question is about. It's, it's about the ethics of autoethnography, which is, a, I guess, a, an interest and something that we in, in anthropology and sociology have had long discussions about and dealings with the ethics committee. So I, I'd just like to hear your reflections on the ethics of not only writing your own story, but writing other people's stories and, 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 and how, how you deal with, 
with issues of informed consent and respect, um, et cetera, and doing no harm. Um, and then I, I have a sort of another question, and, and I'm here with Tim Winter in the background, just in case you're wondering who the tech shirt is and, and we're, we're in, the, in the corridor at, <laughs> at work. Um, my second question is around, um, yeah, how is autoethnography, as you've conducted it, um, different from, from writing a diary? I was, I was really sorry that you, that you didn't go on to talk about the, um, your actual findings or, you know, what, yeah, um, what, what the, um, the, some, some detail about, about what your paper was, was about. Um, so yeah, uh, just, just those, those two questions, how do you deal with ethics and how is this different from writing a diary? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll answer your first question first, ethics. Um, yeah, this is something that I actually, whilst in it, was, I think I was very naive because, well, I was second year. And so I was just like, oh, cool, I've passed my ethics via the course coordinator. So it's like, everything's fine. I don't really need to think about it. But, you know, as someone who's now going through honours and I've had to do the honours ethics, I'm like, wow, there's actually a lot that could have been really, really problematic <laughs> about my work. And um, I think the fact that I wrote about, my research is about grandma and I, it meant that we were constantly talking about things. You know, what can I write about? What can't I write about? And she saw this as an opportunity for us to connect and for us to tell our story to the world. And so she never had an issue with my telling, you know, all our nitty gritty details about our family to whoever read our paper. Um, and I think it very much is like almost our paper. And, you know, she's a, seen in the acknowledgements, they both are. And she's actually um, still trying to translate my paper to read it um, in Mandarin, which is very sweet. And I think that's probably the most ethical thing that really bugs me is that I can't write the bit, my paper in Chinese, that I physically do not have the language capacity to write it in Chinese that, so that she can read it because um, my language skills just aren't there. And I think with informed consent, it, it was just being very transparent about the research process with her being like, okay, I will, we will only write about this specific phone call and like, it's gonna be about this. And I did my best to translate exactly what I was writing to her. And, um, but again, it, the language was something that still irks me a little bit um, because I just don't have the language to communicate with her with Mandarin so um, and, and, and what so, about other members of sorry can I just say what about other members of the family because the problem with autoethnography is that people know who the author is did other members of the family also kind of grant consent or how did you um, deal with that yeah so I I had spoken to a few members and most of I'm going to say about half of them have read it so um yeah, and they all, they, I mean, all, my dad tried to read the theory part and he's just said it was too hard. So he only read the short story. He said the abstract confused him. So, um, yeah, and I, they were all very willing to, actually da a few of them wanted to participate, but I just told them that I just couldn't, I didn't have space like to write about them as well. And they were all very willing to actually be part of this project, but I actually had to tell them that I, I couldn't. And so even being featured like a little bit was kind of um, a win for them, I guess. Yeah, I think my family's very proud of um, being so widely spread around the world. And so the, and then we're, we're very um, warm and welcoming. So I think that's, that's something that really was very helpful. I think if we had any, um, stigma or anything around that, that would be an issue, yeah. Um, second question about the diary. Um, I actually do journal and it is very different to um, how the final writing piece came out. And I think it was because I actually gave myself a word limit for the short stories. And I only wrote about things we talked about in the phone call. So, um, and I wrote about the common themes. So the first short story is about um, missing home and wanting to fly back. And then the second, and it's of my memory of her, my first memory of grandma, because she talked about how I used to always um, try and walk down the stairs of the old house and stuff like that. And then this, the other few stories about um, 
we had a trip planned to China together and she asked me about the holiday or something and I replied like yes I have a suitcase and she didn't ask about a suitcase but I didn't translate the word properly with my like online dictionary and we were laughing about it for ages and then she was telling me that you know sometimes she puts things I send into Google Translate and it just makes zero sense because it absolutely butchers it and it's like funny things about grandpa and um, my cousins and so on and it was I think the writing it was very hard because I was trying to make it seem like a almost like a window into our experience but also there's a lot of like going back into the past into things that happened you know when I was a little kid and into things that were not yet happened but since then have happened because we're always talking about when we're going to see each other next and things that are going to happen so I think in that way it's less diary because it was more our shared perspective rather than just mine does that make any sense <laughs> sorry bit of a ramble yeah yeah I, I guess my question was more around I mean it's an interesting response um yeah the extent to which to which it's analytical or or you know what what added value add does it have a diary is kind of a personal narration um, is it is it anthropological and sociological and in what ways in terms of the writing and, and, the, and the thinking around it yeah so the reason why I actually decided to include the stories in the publication version was because I actually kind of intersect, wove it in with the theory. So I would pick the theme that was in one particular story. So like um, something about, I think my grandpa was sick or something and how we were worried about him and so on. And then that, um, that I think that the piece that follows that is about global aging. Um, and then there's also bits in there about transnational care and how she thinks that, you know, I'm like here and there and like I have like two different identities so there's a bit about like this kind of transnational identity coming out and um, I think that's the reason why I use them is to kind of engage and then flesh it out in theory um, so I'm drawing from that specific short story like the common themes that have been coming out from my data. Good, thank you. That's been really interesting. Um, we have time for your question as well, Richard, and that will be the last question before we move on to Joe's presentation. Thank you. I'll bring myself uh, to life. Um, I'm also going to ask my uh, standard uh, question. Thank you very much indeed for your talk. I thought it was um, fascinating and a very interesting uh, reflection on ethnographic methods. My standard question is whether you used photographs as part of these narrations as well. And if you didn't, um, maybe you could even reflect imaginatively on how it might have been different, getting people to write these stories as uh, prose narratives compared to getting them to sort of tell similar stories, perhaps narrate the same events using photographs, where photographs are a medium through which um, intergenerational knowledge uh, is narrated kind of naturally, as it were, within the kind of everyday setting um, in a way that uh, prose writing may be sort of unnatural uh, or unusual within those uh, settings. Uh, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Um, interesting question, yes. Um, I think I, I would say that I would agree that the visual holds a lot of power and I actually did include not a photo but a screen grab from our conversation especially the um it's in the story where there's like a mistranslation because you can see that grandma um <laughs> if you can read Chinese you can read her message and it like when I reply it's completely unrelated because I mistranslated it um but I did decide not to use any photos because I I don't know, I felt stories were more natural for, for our relationship. It's, um, we don't really send that many photos actually. I mean, we do, but we don't, I think most of it's text. And um, I think for, in terms of photos, that's something that I really want to explore in my current like thesis. And so I've kind of decided to, okay, this is my publication, like that's it done. And then I'm gonna go do I've like, you know, run out of time to do that one. So in my next work, I'm going to look more at photos, which is what I'm doing with my thesis, so. Thank you. Good, thank you. 
Good, thank you. Uh, yeah. We will be moving on to Joe now. Oh, before I do move on, there are a couple of comments for you in the chat. So you might want to check those out. 